عليه وصحبه وسلم اللهم عنا على ذكرك وشكرك وحسن عبادتك اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما رب العالمين أما بعد I believe the last thing we mentioned was the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ when he talked about particular sins and their outcomes. So I think that's the last thing that we talked about. So if that's where you're at, if you're following us, then inshallah, you're on the right page. And what follows is a hadith. The statement is authentic, not the whole story. But the statement of the hadith itself, which is something that we've seen, where the Prophet ﷺ had said, O oh people, Allah Azza wa is telling you, Muru bil ma'rufi wa anhu anil munkar. Enjoin what's good and forbid what is evil. Before you ask me and I do not answer you, and ask for my help, I do not help you. Wa tastansiruni fala ansurukum. Wa tasaluni fala u'tikum. You ask me, and I, meaning you pray, and I don't answer. You ask me, and I don't give, and you want my help, and I will not give it to you. So, muru bil ma'rufi wa nahu anil munkar. So, that part is authentic, and it goes well with the other hadith that we heard from the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, and we will see further confirmation of all of them, which is that you either do that part, right, or Allah Azza wa withholds his help and withholds his uh, answer to your dua. So you must do what Allah loves from you in order to receive what you love from Allah. Does that make sense? And you have to please Allah Azza wa Jal for you to be pleased. You have to do what he wants from you in order to, for him to do what you want from him. But it can't be the case that I'll do whatever I want and then I'll ask Allah Azza wa Jal to come and help me and assist me sometimes in things or out of things that are my own doing. I led myself into this mess by disobeying Allah Azza wa and now I'm saying, Ya Allah, come and help me without even considering that I should change in the process so that this mess would go away. So it's important here to keep in mind that that sha'ira, that duty of forbidding evil and joining what is good is necessary for the health of the ummah for its salvation, for the health of the individual and his salvation, and for Allah Azza wa to answer our dua. So that's basically the gist of what is there. The next is Al-Umari Al-Zahid, Rahimahullah. And he is from the progeny of Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiyallahu anhu. He said, Inna min ghaflatika an nafsika. Part of your neglect, or part of you neglecting yourself, and your distance from Allah Azza wa Jal is that you would see what upsets Allah and you pass it, you ignore it and you don't command, you don't forbid out of fear of those who have no power over you to benefit you or harm you. Right? And then he said, مَنْ تَرَكَ الْأَمْرَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَالنَّهِيَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ مَخَافَةَ الْمَخْلُوقِينَ نُزِعَتْ مِنْهُ الطَّاعَةَ he says, if you leave enjoining what is good and forbidding what is evil out of fear of creation, then respect will be stripped away. Obedience, reverence will be taken away from you. So that, even if you were to command your own children, or your servants, they would belittle your commands. They will not take you seriously. And that is a very profound statement from him, rahimahullah. The first one is this, min ghaflatika an nafsika, neglecting yourself. You know, imagine somebody neglecting himself, right? Who neglects himself? Not purposely. Do we neglect ourselves on purpose? No, because we always are doing things that we believe benefit us, right? So this person whom he see he is, is describing here, that you see a command of Allah being violated. Allah is, Allah is being disobeyed. You don't do anything about it. Why? Because you're afraid of them. So because you're afraid of them, you've upset someone who, Allah Azza wa who really can harm you and benefit you, but they can't. So you see here the irony that he's describing. He says, you fear for yourself. 
So you try to protect yourself from them, even though they can't harm you or benefit you. But in the process of that protection, you really endanger your relationship with the one who really can harm you and benefit you. You don't have to worry about them. You have to worry about him. But you neglect him and you worry about them. So he says, this is ghafla. This is neglect. You're not aware of what benefits you or harm you. Yeah? This is, for instance, like what? You know, you can, someone who is so focused on something, which happens to us physically, you're preoccupied with something. Have you ever you know, done that? You've been doing something, concentrating on one thing, really preoccupied. Then after a few minutes or 10, 15 minutes, you turn and your body is stiff or you twisted something in your body and you say, oh, that really hurts. And you may even need to go to a doctor to examine yourself. Well, how did, how did that happen? Your preoccupation was something, stole away your attention and you hurt yourself. So that is a neglect, not intentional, but a neglect of your body. Or a person who says, for instance, I don't want to go to the doctor. Why? I'm afraid of what he may tell me. If he tells me there's something wrong with me, I, that's something I do not want to face. So I'm simply will live in ignorance. So fearing that may put you in greater trouble than the thing that you're afraid of, right? Because if that is not diagnosed, I'm not saying that whenever you are paranoid about something, you need to go to the doctor. I'm talking about something that is a serious condition. If you neglect it and it develops, it turns into a far greater problem than the one that you're trying to run away from. That is a neglect. But you're thinking, I'm protecting myself. But that's not real protection. So here, I'm afraid of people. So I don't want them to say something bad to me or do something bad to me. So what I'll do, I'll be quiet. I'll not say anything. You think now that you've saved yourself by not saying a thing. But... In the process, you really have put yourself in trouble with Allah Azza wa But they, if you truly have relied on Him, they wouldn't be able to do a thing to you. Right? If you really trusted Allah Azza wa they wouldn't be able to harm you. But now you're in trouble with Allah Azza wa That's why He says, that distance from Allah Azza wa made you forget about what benefits you and what harms you. And that is the greatest kind of um, neglect or lack of focus that is possible. Because Allah says in the Quran, وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ نَسُوا اللَّهَ فَأَنْسَاهُمْ أَنفُسَهُمْ Do not be like those who had forgotten about Allah, so He made them forget, forget about themselves. How do you forget about yourself? It's the same thing. Do you ever stop thinking about yourself? Ever? No. How do you forget about yourself? You don't understand what benefits it and what harms it. You don't understand what's good for it and what's bad. So you pursue the bad thinking that it's good and you run away from the good thinking that it's bad. Your compass uh, had been destroyed. So you don't know what to follow. So you forget about yourself. You work, work, work and you forget about the akhirah. You worry about money and you forget about the next life. You work and you forget about your children, you forget about your marriage, you forget about your health. So you compromise so much for the sake of that limited focus of yours, then you forget about yourself. And then when you wake up, it's too late. Right? So that's what he's saying here, Rahimahullah, is that this is a neglect of yourself. Then you say, how do I survive this? How do I protect myself from it? You say you look at things the way that Allah wants you to look at them, not the way that you would like to look at them. You say, is this right or wrong? Is this halal or haram? Is this excessive or moderate within reason? This is how you know. Right? So you ask yourself these questions. And then he also said, rahimahullah, is that if you compromise what Allah loves out of being afraid of people, so you don't command what is good. You don't forbid what is evil. You leave that. Right? He says, the reverence that people have for you, the respect that they have for you will go away. So even if you have direct power over people, they'll make light of your rights on them. 
oh, this old man, this old lady, this out of touch person, this, 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 they'll make light of it. So you will lose respect. Why did you lose respect? Because with Allah Azza wa Jal, you lost respect. You didn't do what He likes. So Allah Azza wa Jal took away the respect that you have among people. Whereas if you did the opposite, you stood up for what Allah loves and you did it and against what Allah hates and you forbade that, then when you're going to command people, when you want to tell them something, they'll be respect, they'll be honor, they will listen. Not because you yelled, but because Allah Azza wa Jal simply had deposited in you, which is an extension of Allah's obedience, had deposited in you an acceptance. People listen to you when you speak. They don't quarrel with you as much. Okay, there's this rahbah. And some of the scholars of Islam, they said that when they would enter a room, when they speak, there's reverence surrounding them. Right? There is respect that surrounds them. And of course, with the Prophet والسلام, that was clearly manifest. Next to him, والسلام, those especially who those who have Iman, they will feel that reverence, that weight around him والسلام, that comes from his obedience to Allah. So that's what he what that's what he is saying. And you can take from that the following, which is that if you want people to respect you, right? You want your spouse, right? You want your children, you want your neighbors, you want people around, you want them to have that respect for you, then respect the commands of Allah Azza wa But if you compromise this, don't be surprised if people violate your own rights, right? So there is something missing in our lives, go back and fix what is between us and Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. In the following, which is authentic, Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu, he said, Ya ayyuhal nas, he said, O oh people, you read the following ayah and you misapply it. تَضَعُونَهَا عَلَى غَيْرِ مَوْضِعِهَا You don't really understand it. And because of that, you misapply the ayah. Because you could misunderstand or you can understand but misapply. Follow? So you can understand what the ayah means. But then when you want to take it yeah, to reality, to the circumstances around you, you don't really know how to apply it. So it's saying here, what is the ayah? It says, Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu alaykum anfusakum. Ya ayyuhu, oh you who have iman, focus, be concerned with yourselves. Take care of yourselves. La yadurrukum man dalla idha tadaytum. You will not be harmed by those who are misguided if you are guided. So you understand what the ayah means? Take care of yourselves, focus on yourselves. You will not be harmed by those who are misguided if you yourself are, are guided. So he's saying, I heard the Messenger والسلام, say, Indeed, people, when they see the oppressor, and they do not stop him, they don't hold him by the hand and stop him, or they do not reform the bad things that he is doing, Allah Azza wa Jal will soon overwhelm them with a punishment from him. So he's telling the Sahaba and the Tabi'een, whoever is listening, he's telling them that this hadith explains that ayah. Because if you just take the ayah and what it said, or what you think it is saying, what would you come up with? Focus on yourself. Don't worry about other people. Their misguidance doesn't harm you. Isn't it? Whether they do A or B, as long as you're okay, it doesn't matter what they're doing. To each his own, you could say, right? Focus on yourself. Religion is a private matter. It's between me and Allah Azza wa Jal. Isn't these things that you hear? That's between me and Allah Azza wa Jal. Iman is here. Who are you to judge me? Right? Iman is here. Who are you to judge me? Who gave you the power to say, I'm right and you're wrong, or you're wrong and I'm right? You don't know what is between me and Allah. So you hear these things. This ayah and that hadith refute all of that, or at least let's say correct it. Because the ayah itself, if you were to understand it, part of the hidayah that Allah wants from you is for you to command good and forbid evil. Because your hidayah, your guidance, is incomplete until you do that. And if you understand that, then you understand the ayah right. So Allah is saying what? You will not be harmed by those who are misguided if you are guided. And part of your guidance is to tell them that they are misguided. You follow me? 
So you can't just keep it to yourself and say, do whatever you want, and I'll do whatever I want. Because whatever you do is not going to harm me. No. What you do has an effect on me. Right? And what I do has an effect on you. So it's not just your business, or this is my private business. This is my personal choice. And you are free to, do, to, to have your own personal choices. If things are public, this is no longer personal. Right? If things are public, this is, this is what the ayah is teaching. And definitely, the hadith is clear about it. Once it is public, it is not, it's not personal anymore. Because if I see something wrong, at least I have to say that it's wrong, tell you that it's wrong, uh, guide you to ways to overcome that wrong, and if I've done everything in my power, then your sin will not harm me. But I've tried all that I have, all I can do. If I don't do this, your sin will come to harm me. Right? So any injustice that is seen in the world today, any injustice that is seen in Muslim lands, any injustice, any haram that is around, if we fail within our means, if we fail to condemn it and speak against it, it comes back to hurt us. So this is the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. He says that when people see the oppressor committing that oppression and they don't stop him, meaning that they have the power to stop him, but they do not stop him, Allah will soon overwhelm them with a punishment from him. So did, did your sin harm me or not? Absolutely. It will destroy all of us. And this is like the example that the Prophet ﷺ gave in another hadith of people boarding a ship. All of them are on the same ship. Some are on the top level, some are the bottom level. And those at the bottom level, they say, well, we just want to dig a hole in the ship to get water. And he said, the people at the top level, if they don't stop them, what happens to them? All of them drown. So we're all on the same ship. This earth, it's all the same ship. Any country, it's all the same ship. Any community, any, it's all the same ship. So if you don't fix it, everybody's going to drown. So this tells you that this is a collective and also possibly an individual responsibility based on, you know, abilities, right? So this is what he had said, radiallahu uh, anhu. So he's correcting here an understanding. The following is as weak as a hadith, but it's authentic as a saying reported from al awzai from Bilal ibn Sa'd, rahimahumullah. He says, إِذَا خَفِيَةِ الْخَطِيئَةِ لَمْ تَضُرَّ إِلَّا صَحِبَةً So this is not a hadith, but it's a saying. But it's a sound saying. إِذَا خَفِيَةِ الْخَطِيئَةِ If sin is private, it will only harm the sinner. وَإِذَا ظَهَرَتْ فَلَمْ تُغَيَّرْ ضَرَّةِ الْعَامَّةِ But if it's public and it's not changed, it will hurt the masses, will hurt the public. So there's private and public sin. And there's a very significant difference between private and public and between moving something from the private to the public. If it's private, it hurts whom? The one who has done it. So the harm is restricted. right? Because it's not normal. People have not approved. People, do, do, it's not, they don't consider it okay. You can't go and say, I've done this and I've done that. There is shame. There is regret. That's why it's hidden. And that means that there is piety and righteousness that looks at that and condemns it. So you're not brave enough to come out and say, I did this or didn't do that. So that means there is still good left in society that forces that sin to hide. So that is a good society. And that sin becomes public, it means that righteousness has diminished to the level where he could go public with that sin and be safe from repercussion, from condemnation, from criticism, or even physical consequences. You are fine. And when you're fine, it means that righteousness has diminished, wickedness has spread, the sin, of, the sin is no longer a sin, it's now something that is normal and accepted. And that's why it needs to be fought as it's moving from the private to the public, to be forced back into the private sphere, not the public sphere. And it's very, very foolish 
whether it is in a Muslim country or a non-Muslim country, for people to say, well, you know what? A lot of people are doing it anyway in private. Why not just make it public? Right? You'd hear that. Oh, you know, in some Muslim countries where, you know, alcohol, let's say, is forbidden. Um, a lot of people are drinking it in, in private, right? They smuggle it and they do this and that. Might as well just regulate it and make it public. At least we could control, at least we can get some revenue, at least there's no black market. What's the problem with that? Is that once it goes public, it becomes okay. okay. And the rampant use of a particular sin privately is not an excuse for people to regulate and legislate and make it okay. So normalization is a very dangerous problem. It's not, when we're talking, we're not only talking about economics, we're talking about money, we're talking about Allah's anger or pleasure. And you're moving from Allah's displeasure, um, Allah's pleasure into Allah's displeasure by announcing to everybody, here we're going to do this and it's going to be public and financed and approved and regulated. So it will hurt the masses, it will hurt the public when it goes public. Okay? And the more that, the more that you educate and iman increases, the more that there is pressure to return that sin that is public now into the private sphere, to, to return it to where it came from. Enough criticism, enough boycott, uh, enough condemnation, distance will force people who are committing that sin to retreat to the private sphere to where they came from. And that's where it's supposed to be. And it's the same thing if a person himself commits a sin. If I am a sinner with a particular sin, it's most likely that Allah will forgive it as long as it is private. If I go and brag about it, then I'm inviting people to commit that sin. And that is less likely that be forgiven. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, Kullu mu'afa illa al -mujahirin. All of my ummah will be forgiven except those who are public with it. You go public with a sin, whatever that sin is, it's less likely for it to be forgiven. Because everybody who watches you and sees you is being invited by you to commit that sin. From the time you leave your house or you start talking about it or you, you, know, you send a text or on social media and you talk and you discuss and you, that's all an invitation. So everybody who is invited, you're responsible for them. Right? And then of course you're less likely to repent from it. And why is that? Because you made it normal. You made it okay. You started to defend it. Right? The following is from Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu anhu uh, where he said, Tushiku al-Qura an takhraba wa hiya amira. He says, the cities and the towns, they're about to uh, be in ruin while they're still prosperous or while they're still populated. So he says, how will it be in ruin while they are still populous, populated, or prosperous? Meaning, while they're still prosperous, while they're still populated, they will be in ruin. How does this happen? And he says, إِذَا عَلَى فُجَّارُهَا أَبْرَارَهَا وَسَادَ الْقَبِيلَةَ مُنَافِقُوهَا He says, if the sinners overwhelm the righteous, and the hypocrites are the leaders. So if the worst of them become the leaders and they overpower the righteous, that is a sign that it's in ruins. Even if it looks on the outside like it's what? Thriving. That's a prediction. Right? So if you see that in a country or see in a town or among a people that it's foolish are its leaders, then that is a prediction that what's going to come next is its destruction. Because... Otherwise, the foolish would not be leading them, right? Now, the destruction, it doesn't mean that it's going to happen tomorrow or it's going to happen next year because Allah Azza wa Jal, right? There's, a, there's a, a, let's call it a rhythm to nations. They take a time to rise and they take a time to fall. They don't rise all of a sudden and they don't fall all of a sudden except in, you know, maybe extreme cases or exceptional cases. But... Unless we are predicting divine judgment that's just going to come down and destroy a nation, it takes a while for it to 
collapse, right, to decline. But you can predict that decline based on the leadership and based on that spread of sin. So if you see, there's a lot of sin. And some of the sin that, sins that we talked about, if you remember, you know, fornication, uh, interest, uh, the, the, the actions of the people of Lut, um, things like that, uh, economic duplicity, manipulation, injustice in general. You see it inward and outward. You look at that nation and you say they're inviting Allah's punishment and their own destruction. The following is a, is a weak hadith, but nonetheless, right, there's a, a benefit in it. But just remember that it is weak. Uh, he says the wicked or the worst of my ummah will overpower or overrule its righteous until the believer among them will hide as the hypocrite will hide among us today. And that is something that was witnessed and probably in some Muslim countries is still being witnessed today. So what is being said there is that what? At once upon a time, the righteous had the upper hand. So if, they, if we had a hypocrite, the hypocrite would have to hide his hypocrisy. If he does not pray, if he does not give zakah, if he does not want to do the things that the righteous want to do, what he will do? He will hide his hypocrisy. Do things in public, and if he doesn't, doesn't have to, he won't do them. And he will hide his disbelief. And that's when the society is healthy and righteous. It says the things will switch and they will change. So on top you'll have the worst and at the bottom, meaning the weakest will be the righteous. So that the righteous will have to hide their iman, just like the hypocrites used to have to hide their iman. And that happened in Muslim lands, right? And it happens in non-Muslim lands as well, right? Which is what in some Muslim lands and some non-Muslim lands, if you had to pray, you have to hide it. If you have to go to Fajr, you have to hide it. You'd be questioned. If you have the Qur'an, you have to hide it. If you have particular Islamic books, you have to hide them. If you follow the Sunnah, you have to hide that. And sometimes among your family, right? Among your family even, you'd have to hide a few things from them so that you're not being accused of being too extreme or too rigid or too this. You're not open-minded. You're not modern enough. So subhanAllah, that's kind of the weakness that the believer will find himself in that even he cannot, either you will have to hide all or some of his iman or the way that you want to express your iman it has to be in ways that are in themselves non-islamic you have to explain your faith in ways that are non-islamic or oh, faith is beneficial to your health right i'm not saying it's not but how do you want to appeal to them because they're not going to accept the religious logic so how is religion appealing to them well if you are religious that helps you helps your health alleviates you know stress uh, there are social connections and networks and this is all worldly benefits where is the benefit of the hereafter but you can't use that language because that language is not dominant and you're not confident enough in presenting that language to those who are around you but you have to and don't assume that they don't understand it make them understand it because that is a universal language that is a language that is based on the fitrah Right? So you're not being hosted, you know, by a person who is a disbeliever. You know how people, when they talk about Islam, they do it in certain ways. But if they're hosted by the media, sort of like the way that they talk about Islam becomes very different. Because they have to appeal to a non-Muslim audience. So they start talking about it in ways that don't make sense to you, but it makes sense to a secular audience. You understand what I'm talking about? Yeah. I'm not a practicing Muslim. Yeah. Yeah, the, the thing, the idea of a non practicing Muslim, right? The one you mentioned here. How, 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 you, how you can ever develop in your head that idea of a non practicing Muslim? Okay? Where you say, I'm a Muslim of a weak Iman. That's what it is, a non-practice, as if it is what? Acceptable to say, I'm Muslim, but I don't practice. No, your iman is very weak. So that's, that's, that's the terminology that should be used. So 
you want to you wanna be confident enough in what you believe to express it in the way that it was revealed. And don't worry about whether they understand it or not. They just do your best to communicate it. But don't worry about whether they understand it or not. Because when you switch the language and switch the way of thinking, you already have compromised the message. Right? So here is the weakness that we are talking about. We retreat so much that we fail to communicate and assert what we believe. No, say, right? Say that this is wrong. Say that this is right. You know, you've, you hear some, um, and I don't have the kind of the, the full um, kind of text of what they were saying, but when Christians were hosted uh, and they were against gay marriage and what have you, and they would host them on channels like what you've mentioned, and they would ask them why. And they would cite um, secular, secular uh, causes. Uh, this is not good for the family, and this happens, and there is this statistics and that. And you understand why they're against it. Why don't you say that it is against what God wants? Why did it say that's not biblical? Why don't you just say this and then cite whatever language? But you're trying what, to convince them using this stat and this argument and that thing. And you're not really landing. Your argument is not landing. Not very really well. They know why, why you're against it. You know why you're against it. Just be public and come out and say what you're against. Because when you say, then you're being people to your own point of view. Now we're discussing this. Now what you believe, but this, the Bible. Well, in our case, the Quran, right? You're discussing the Quran. You're discussing the Sunnah. You're discussing what Allah said or did not say. Let's talk about this. And then all the other examples that you want to cite come later, but this. So be assertive. Don't retreat. Be wise, right? But don't retreat out of fear like the hypocrites used to retreat. What you have is very strong. So you need to be uh, confident in what you have. The following is, um, again, is a, is a weak um, hadith. And it says in it that there will come a time where the heart of the believer will melt or will dissolve like salt will dissolve in water. And they said, why is this, O Messenger of Allah? He says, because he sees a disobedience, a munkar, a sin, and they cannot change it. It's weak. But the idea there in this, in this weak hadith is that the believer's heart will melt because he sees something wrong and he can't do anything about it. Right? So that's the idea that's there. The following is, is uh, authentic, and it adds uh, an important condition to the uh, punishment of Allah that will descend if we leave al amr bil ma'ruf wa nahi anil munkar he says ma min qawmin yu'malu fihim bil ma'asi you're not going to find a people where sin is being committed among them hum a'azzu wa akthar mimma ya'maluhu lam yughayyiruh they are more powerful and more numerous than the sinners but they do not change it unless except that Allah will overwhelm them with punishment so here's that's the condition here that this hadith states which is what Sin is being committed, and you are more numerous, and you are more powerful than the sinners, but you don't change it. It's so Allah will punish them. Right? And that punishment could be, wallahu a'lam, a divine punishment just like we read about in the Quran, but more likely it's going to be that Allah Azza Jal will send, going to send to them uh, more disagreements and frictions and animosity uh, between them economic hardship, killings, murder, uh, drugs, um, intoxicants, diseases, one after the other, right? So Allah Azza Jal will overwhelm them with punishment. And again, look at countries and see the political turmoil that they are in, the political troubles that they're in, how people really on the inside, they hate each other, right? They don't trust each other, right? And you'll understand that that is a consequence of what? Disobeying Allah Azza wa That is, if you lie, right? If you lie. And you keep lying and lying and lying until people stop trusting you. Well, that is punishment. Right? So people today, they don't trust the media, right? Before all of this happened, even before the Gaza things, people didn't trust the media. So when you don't trust the media, and you don't trust the politicians. So you have lowest trust in the politicians, right? And you don't trust the media. Then what does that indicate but an erosion of trust in the institutions, right? Of the country. How do you get your information? 
Who do you listen to? Huh? That's it. Means that people cannot relate to each other anymore because you're lying and because people now have different sources. I'll believe my sources, not yours, and vice versa. And if, if your leader gets elected, I'm not listening to him. That, that was just a, uh, a fraudulent election. But my leader, he's elected uh, fair and square. That is a collapse of the political institutions and a collapse of the country as a whole. So the more that you lie, you think that lying has no consequences. They kept lying and lying until people, until their own people, stopped trusting them. This is a consequence. So this is iqabun am. This is a general punishment. Right? So this is what Allah Azza wa is saying. You, as a country, whether you're Muslim or not, as a country, you enjoyed a lot of Allah's blessings and you're fine. You wasted those blessings and you committed heinous acts against Allah Azza wa and against the believers and against humanity then general punishment will come and will surround you. And that's part of it. The following is a hadith that we've explained before about the person who's inside his intestines will um, come out of his body on the day of judgment. And that is because he used to command good but not do it, forbid evil but commit that. So we've explained that hadith so we will not repeat it. The following is a, uh, it's a Jewish tradition it's authentic, but of course there is kind of always something missing there, right? So we'll translate it and we'll tell you what's missing there. So it says, كَانَ حَبْرُ مِنْ أَحْبَارِ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ So one of the scholars of Banu Israel, the Israelites, he used to uh, give مَوْعِضَ وَتَذْكِرَ He used to admonish and teach people and remind them. And then when a woman would come and frequent his home, come to his house, and he would teach them. And so, فَرَأَ بَعْضَ بَنِيهِ يَوْمًا يَغْمِزُ النِّسَاء So he saw one of his children, one of those days, يَغْمِزُ النِّسَاء يَغْمِز means either to wink or to touch. So he would wink or he winked at a woman or he touched a woman. Meaning unlawfully. Because he had like a mixed uh, audience. Men and women. So one of his children did that to one of the females. Either he winked at her or he touched her unlawfully. So he said, slow down my son, slow down my son. Mahlan ya bunay, mahlan ya bunay. So it is this here, فَسَقَطَ min سَرِيرِهِ He fell off his bed, or fell off his couch that he was on, and he broke his spine, his mother miscarried, and his children were killed, and Allah revealed to the Prophet who was living at that time, tell so and so, the scholar, that I will not get out or give you a righteous offspring. After all this, I will not give you a righteous us offspring at all. The extent of your anger for my sake is for you to have said to your son, slow, my, slow down my son, slow down my son. So the tradition here wants to say what? Right. Wants to say that if you fail to adhere to that commanding good and forbidding, if you fail to adhere to it, you'll see severe consequences. In his case, right? He failed to admonish his son. He failed to really stop him. He wasn't really angry. And maybe perhaps this was his son. So he wasn't really strict. He wasn't really harsh. Not as he was supposed to, to stop that evil. So you say all these things happened to him. So he broke his spine, meaning that he'll never be able to give children again, to have children again. His, mother was, his uh, wife was pregnant. She lost the child. And his children died. To say what? no righteous offspring will come from your line, right? Now, of course, isn't this a little bit too much, right? One, two, three, right, for just that? But this is a tradition, right? And it's coming from Banu Israel, and it doesn't mean that it actually happened. Because kind of they kind of embellish certain things. So maybe it never happened, or if something happened, not in this way. But what do you take from it is what? The message. The message is still sound, meaning that if you fail here, you'll see consequences. And sometimes they could be really immediate, and they could really surprise you, and other times they'll be delayed. And he'll talk about those delayed ones. In the next hadith also, we've explained it, and that hadith is about those insignificant sins. And he, when the Prophet ﷺ warned us about them, and he says, beware of them. Because their example is like some people who, when they wanted to cook a meal, they went and they collected st sticks and twigs, small ones, here from here and here and here, until they kindled a huge fire. 
and they cooked their meal and he's saying alayhi salatu wasalam all these small sins when they you collect they end up destroying you so that obviously tells us what right just think of yourself for instance if you just waste a dollar each day just throw it away now that's not significant right a dollar a dollar a dollar a dollar you may not pay attention to it but if you add it up it really adds up to something if you look at it, look at it in some, you will say, I really wasted a lot of money. Why did I waste it? He says, because you just looked at it as a dollar per day. So if you were to do this as an experiment with yourself, right? Put a jar and then whenever you do a sin that you want to commit, and this between you and Allah Azza wa Jal, because you don't want other people to come and say, oh wow, you have a lot of coins. That means that you really did many wrongs today. That is between you and Allah Azza wa Jal. But just add a dollar whenever you commit this and do this and keep doing it. And then at the end of the week or the end of the month, see how much have you've collected. Because this is the sum that is with Allah Azza wa now in terms of sin. So you think about it. A one single sin is not small because it has sisters. Uh, it has a family uh, that was lived before and now also will come after. And you are raising a family now of sinners, right? Which is small sins. So together they are really significant. So that's what he's saying, alayhi salatu wasalam. Do not look down on any small sin because that act of looking down on it is the act that will make you overlook it. But if you're sensitive enough, then it's likely that you will at least say astaghfirullah. But if you say, no, it doesn't matter, how will you say astaghfirullah? You'll forget about it. So it has to matter to you. It has to be big in your eyes, right? And that's Anas ibn Malik, the following thing. Uh, the following uh, athar from him and it's in Sahih al-Bukhari Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu anhu he said he says you are doing things meaning he's talking to the people today the tabi'een you're doing things that in your eyes they are thinner than a piece of hair thinner than a piece of hair adaqqu min al-shari but we used to consider them at the time of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam among the destructive sins there's a very small thing, thing in your eye today. But the time of the Prophet والسلام, that was a big thing that we would not do. But today, you look down on it. So it tells you that the transition happened already at the time of the Tabi'een. Consider. And maybe one of the things that he's talking about is missing the beginning of the Salah. Not the whole Salah. In Jama'ah. Yani it's not, not praying. Look how far we've come. It's not, not praying at all. When he asks someone, do you pray? He says, no. It's not that. And it's not praying some and missing some. And it's not only praying at home. And it's not missing the jama'ah. It's coming to jama'ah, but missing the takbir. He could be talking about that. Because for us, right, we wouldn't do this. You would come on time for the takbir. You wouldn't miss any of it. For us, alhamdulillah, if you just come to the masjid maybe once a week. Right? Just once a week. So that's the difference. So again, he says, how are you going to look at your situation? If you're going to look at it collectively using the same scale as everybody else, they're going to bring you down. Because everybody's right scale is tempt to, tends to be down. Okay? Who eats halal? Who drinks halal? Who looks at halal? How many people commit this sin or this sin or that sin? You look at the majority of people. I'm not talking about non-Muslims. Talking about us as Muslims. You look at the majority of people, we're doing these things and not doing the other things we're supposed to. You hold yourself to those standards, you're going to be brought down. So you need to extract yourself, right? And look at yourself the way that a different generation looked. Those are the different standards. So that you be able to what? Rise above it and bring people out of it. So no, this is not right. And it should never be right. Right? The way that we dress, the way that we cut our hair, the way that we, you know, men dress like women, women dress like men, this is not right. Yeah. How we speak, how we think. So when you find something that is wrong, common practice does not make it right. So you have to extract yourself from it. So that's what he's saying. How you see it, that's what I think the essence of what he's saying is, is how you see things is not how things are. Right? So look at it as the Prophet ﷺ used to. And the following hadith kind of emphasizes it about the woman and the cat and hellfire. Yani, a woman was punished 
Mimin will be punished in hellfire because of a cat that she jailed, imprisoned, kept captive until it died. So she, meaning the woman, entered hellfire. She did not feed it. She did not give it water. And she did not let go of it so that it could feed itself upon the animals of the earth. So here the Prophet ﷺ wants to show you, especially the now, see, again, consider how they looked at things and how we looked at things, right? Today, cats and dogs are what? Pets, right? So a person, like if a person does this to a cat, what will happen to them? In some countries, you'll be punished. If you do this, in some countries, you'll be punished for it, right? If you harm an animal like that. Or if you're known to have done that on social media, what will they do to you? Okay? They will kill you, right? I mean, figuratively, but they will kill you. It's an irredeemable act. How could you this, do this to an animal? So here we're not talking about the pets, those cute, fluffy, nice pets. We're talking about a cats that are strays. Right? Because they didn't have these, you know, bred cats. We're talking about cats that are strays. So it's some kind of a cat that is not as cute, not as, be not as beautiful, not as pampered, not as nice, right, to you, as maybe your pet cat. Still, she kept it captive. So in her mind, in her eyes, this was what? Was this a punishable sin? I don't think so in her mind. She thought that it was... Why would you do it if this was a punishable sin? Unless, there's, unless you're sick, right? Why would you do it? But the, a part of her must have felt that this is wrong. But maybe she thought, what? It's just a cat. As people today, right? I mean, I've heard people you know, say, I mean, in, in some countries, right? When you see a cat, you want to run it over. Or an animal, they just want to run it over. They just, it's fun to do that. Or you find some birds, you just want to kill them. It's just fun to do that. And you don't think that you're going to be punished for it, but it is punishable. So something as small as this turns out that it's not small. Imagine, imagine, you live your whole life trying to do good and then you enter hellfire because of something like this. Imagine, right? Just you, just you killed, a, tortured a, uh, uh, a bird. Just that. Or an animal. Just that. So there are things that are small, and this is not your only example, things that are small that you'll say to yourself, it's not, it doesn't matter. Allah will forgive it. And you don't know that when you meet Allah Azza wa Jal, oh, that's the thing that is going to take you inside. Right? The following, and the following is authentic to Hudayfa, and it's important to understand. And they asked Hudayfa, رضي الله عنه إنه قيل له في يوم واحد تركت بنو إسرائيل دينهم. He says, did بنو إسرائيل, right, the Israelites, did they just abandon the religion abruptly in one day? Right? Did they just abandon their religion just that all of a sudden like that? He said, no. But if they were to, if they were commanded to do something, they will neglect it. And if they were forbidden to do something, they would do it. Until they withdrew or they took off their religion as a person takes off his clothes completely. Right? So he's saying that this is gradual, not abrupt, not sudden. And he's describing here, radiallahu anhu, what happens to all of us. Again, individuals and nations. And you see one of us, you know, Two years ago, three years ago, mashallah, he's righteous, he's doing this, she's doing that. Obeying Allah Azza wa Jal, all the obligations, staying away from the haram. Then you see them after two, three years. And they're very different. Right? They have forgotten all of these things. 180 degrees change. And you think about it. Did that happen all of a sudden? That they were really religious, really righteous on Monday. Tuesday, completely the opposite. Does it happen this way? Is this change is gradual. The same thing with nations. Nations that are righteous, how do they lose this righteousness? What gets introduced? Sin, a little bit of it. You just open a little bit of the door and until this becomes accepted. And then you open a little bit more and then a little bit more and then a little bit more. And then sin gradually becomes more acceptable, bigger, firmer, and then the change overwhelms that society. So if you want to understand 
how to fix a nation or to how corrupt a nation you want to understand how to fix yourself or to how corrupt another how they use or how they introduce corruption if they want to introduce uh, corrupt a human being this is how they do it it's all gradual can you okay you're not going to do 100% can you just give me 1% that's the only thing we want from you and you'll say what oh, well it's not a big deal I'll do a 1% what's the problem with the 1% you've opened the door and it invites the next 2% and the next 3%, right? So if a woman, let's say she has hijab on and she has, you know, and it's really good hijab. The first step in trying to remove that hijab is what? Have her admire those who are wearing less of a hijab. Not, in t not uncovered, but less of a hijab. A shiny hijab, an attractive hijab, a very fashionable hijab. Have her admire those people. Because uh, we know that you're not going to admire the other side. But the fashionistas... Who the model? Who modeled the hijab? Okay, don't you don't you want to be fashionable? Don't you want to be attractive? And there is all of us, right? All of us want people's approval. And if there was a woman, and you have to understand, this is a struggle with sisters, especially if they used to kind of wear makeup before, and they used to be very fashionable before, and now they moved into hijab, is that they will feel themselves always inferior in comparison because this other lady has all this makeup on, the latest things on, and she's attracting attention, but I don't. So you feel ugly. Right? You understand that? You feel ugly. So she needs to be validated. Okay, how is she going to feel attractive again? The shaitan always comes and says, put on makeup. You, you look beautiful. Why are you, why do you look so old like this? Why do you look pale? Put on some makeup. Pick, put up some, some color. Put on some perfume. Just a little bit. And if she's a little bit weak, she'll do it. And if he can move her one inch closer to that, then he've succeeded. And he led her. And then you'll move a little bit inch closer. So the clothes become tighter. And they recede, and they show more of the hair, more of the body, more of the arms, more of the legs, right? It's gradual, 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 gradual. That's how it happens. That's how it happens with men. So he sees where you are, and he takes you gradually until you become the opposite of what you were. So if you catch yourself, and some people, they can catch themselves. After you they start on a path, they say, wait a second, where am I going? I would never thought I would be doing this. Stop and go back. So you understand where the shaitan is taking you. The problem is that he also is a masterful at blinding us because we have temptations, so you don't see it. So you have to stop the beginner, the beginning sin, the sin that is wrong, the desire to imitate, okay, the sinful, the disbelievers. Who are you trying to imitate? The righteous? To think about it. Who are you admiring? Are they righteous? First of all, are they Muslim? That's the beginning of it. The way that you want to dress, the way that you want to have your hair, the way that you want to have tattoos or no tattoos, who are you admiring? Okay, catch yourself. You have to catch yourself. Oh, he's not a Muslim. He's not worthy of admiration. Then. You have to stop. You have, can't imitate him. And then if he's Muslim, is he pleasing to Allah or not? And is he pleasing to Allah in this thing or not? So if you can cut that then you save yourself. And if you think that you could stop at one sin, uh, you're not as smart as you think. Can't. Because the shaitan knows all of us. So here he's saying, Hudayfa rahimahullah, this is how a person takes off faith entirely. Slowly. By neglecting the first command and committing the first sin. And then you're down a path that only Allah Azza wa Jal can save you from. And that's how a nation also gets corrupted. And he says, And he says, it's because of this that some of the Salaf have said that sins are the messengers of disbelief and that a kiss is the messenger of intimacy, um, intercourse, and that singing is the messenger of fornication and that looking is the messenger of ishq, which is afflicted longing. And disease is the messenger of death. Meaning that announces it and pulls it. So if somebody becomes sick, sick is the announcement of death. It's, that's, that's what the messenger is, right? It's telling you that death is going to come. Unless you're destined not to. But typically, you become sick, you die. This predicts that. So saying it's the same thing 
He says, a kiss leads to intercourse. So here he's talking about halal, right? But then he says what? Uh, well, even he may be talking about halal or not halal. It could be both. It's like a kiss. Yeah, let's say it's both. A kiss is the messenger of intercourse. Meaning if you say to yourself, right, if it's halal, then we don't need to worry about it. But if you say to yourself in the haram, I'll just kiss and stop. Okay? And you're especially male, right? Okay? You know you're lying to yourself. Right? Kiss and stop. Kiss and stop. And that can't happen. Because if kiss becomes an accepted thing right now, it will push you uh, to do more. You can't stop yourself, right? So if you want to stop zina, you got to stop anything and everything at least to it. You can't like kind of roam around and think, okay, I'll be safe. You can't be. Again, you're lying to yourself if you do this. You can only be safe if you're really far away from it. And then he, when he says, well, غناء بريد الزنا and singing is the messenger of zina. Now you know why? Zina is fornication. You know why? Because it calls to it. It inflames the desire. Even, 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 you know what? If it's not the same awful lyrics that we have today. Even if it's lyrics of the past. Lyrics of the past, it was music. And also talking about how beautiful this woman is, you know, and how, you know, you, you miss her and all of this. But this inflames the desire. Oh, love, and I need to love, and I love this woman. I need to be with her. I can't live without her. And she thinks the same. So that what, what? They call it ruqya to zina. The ruqya that brings zina. The thing that calls on zina. So if you add now to it now, the awful lyrics that they have today, which are so indecent, okay? That they're just about sex, sex, sex all the time. And you listen to that and listen to the music that accompanies all of this. What do you think it's driving you to do? Of course. Zina upon zina. It says it's an explicit call for zina. It's not just describing the beauty of a woman kind of in, in a classical, beautiful, refined way. No, 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 no. It's asking you to go and commit zina. Right? So if you listen to this with the music, then that's where it's going to be heading. Right? Another Rubaridul Ishqi says, if you look, you're going to be afflicted with longing. Oh, she's be so beautiful. He's so beautiful, right? And you can't have that, and it's going to torment you. And we'll be talking about Ishq, inshallah, later, and how that it is also a disease and sickness. And Al Ma'asi Baridul Kufri, that's the first thing that he said. Al Ma'asi Baridul Kufri, that sins invite disbelief. Right? How do they invite disbelief? Okay. That if a person had, has iman, let's suppose that we have iman. When you sin, what happens to our iman? Decreases, it falls, diminishes. And when that happens, there's now extra space for the shaitan to whisper and for other ideas to inhabit the vacated space of iman. And you will see, and he will talk about this in the Azza wa Jal shortly, not today. He'll be talking about it and how you will be alienated from the truth, alienated from the Quran. You know what, you know what alienated is? You don't feel I like you know what to be close to. You feel a distance, wahsha. You will be alienated from the truth, the Quran, from the Sunnah, from the righteous. So all that is because of sin. And the more sin that you have, the more that your the vision will be obstructed. Why is this wrong? I don't see it anymore. Before you could, but now you can't. Why should we do this? Before you could see it, but now you can't. What? Because something now is obstructing your vision. You think you could see clearly, but you can't see clearly. Why can't you see clearly? Because something is covering your heart. And what is covering your heart? That's the sin. Huh? Just like this sin. You know like when you become sick and you can't taste food? Anyone got that when they got COVID? Right? You can't taste food anymore. I said, what's wrong with this? Well, it used to be my favorite thing. I can't taste it anymore. The food is the food. What changed? I changed. Something is wrong with me. That's not normal, but you'll think it's normal, and you'll think it's normal because there's sin around. So you can't see right from wrong. You'll object to the truth. You'll accept falsehood. You'll love the people who follow falsehood. You'll hate people who follow the truth. What has been a conviction that you had now shakes, is shaky. You'll reject the truth, and you'll disbelieve. And it can happen. 
So a person has to seriously consider that, especially for those, especially for us today. You're living in a world that is dominated by Islam? No. And you're living in a non-Muslim country. So your challenge is double challenge because you're surrounded with sin. So you need to understand that this sin has deep impact on you and your understanding and your practice and your iman. So you need to protect from self, yourself from it as much as possible and always come back and uh, ask Allah Azza wa for guidance so that you tell him, Ya Allah, am I seeing things the way that I'm supposed to see them or not? So ask Allah continuously to be protected from uh, fitna. So I think we'll stop here, inshallah, and take your questions if you have any. No. No, let me check, inshallah, see if we have any online questions. Naam, that is, yeah, as long as the sin is private and I don't know about it, right? Uh, then, yeah, the private sins harm them, they don't harm society, and it don't, do not harm the righteous. When they become public, then the public sin harms the sinful and the righteous when the righteous fail to uh, criticize them. Does that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're talking about in a Muslim country, oh, okay, but not likely in a non-Muslim country, because in a non-Muslim country you probably... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. So the question is that what if uh, the evil that is being committed, because we have to speak out against evil in order to stop it and uh, fight the tendency to normalize it. What if the person who's committing that evil or spreading that evil is a person of power, has authority in a Muslim land? Is it better to speak out against it or better to be quiet or, or better be quiet? So first of all, there's a difference between attacking the person, that person personally for that sin and speaking out against that sin. So if you can manage to, and this is how it's supposed to be, leave out the person so you don't attack him. Okay, you don't go, this person, you're at fault for this and you will do this, 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 because then it becomes personal. But rather attack the wrong that is being happening. So you say allowing alcohol. Let's say he allowed alcohol. You say alcohol is haram and no one should drink it. And it does this, 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 this to the country. We should fear Allah Azza wa Jal. We shouldn't allow gambling. We shouldn't allow this. We shouldn't allow that. This festival, this thing, that meat, this thing. All these are haram. So you speak against, against that evil without attacking that person. If you can manage to do this, then you've done what you're supposed to do and you've done it in the right way. That's more likely for it to be accepted, more likely for him not to feel that he's personally being attacked for it and turned against you and against everybody who is against that sin simply based on personal reasons. So if you want results, you know, you don't personalize the matter and make him the target because I hate him for whatever reason. That's between him and Allah Azza wa but you speak against that evil. If you're in a situation where speaking against that evil, even that will bring greater harm than the benefit that you're trying to bring and that needs consultation with those who are around you, then you wouldn't. You would refrain from talking and find appropriate ways of changing that, that evil. Because in anything that you are trying to do, you don't want to introduce more harm than good, right? So if it ends up introducing greater harm than the good that you're trying to do, then you wouldn't do it. It would be foolish to do something like that. So you think about kind of the benefits and the harms, 
And if there's more benefit, then you proceed. If there's more harm, then you would not. And then you would ask people around how to do it. And sometimes Allah guides you, right? If there's a way that Allah Azza wa guides you to the best of ways. Allah. Let me ask and I'll come back to you. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're fine, inshallah. No, I mean, if those who are defending uh, justice and promoting justice, right, and they happen to be, as you said, they're non-Muslims, they're secular Muslim, uh, they're um, whatever their category be, you love them for the good that they're doing. That's natural. Um, there are other things that they are doing that would upset you. That if you were hear them to talk about, about their belief in Allah Azza wa Jal, it would enrage you, you wouldn't like it. So that part, is reserved for them. You know, okay, I don't, like, each person, like, love, love and love is, let's say, what, what am I going to say, complicated? Complicated in the sense of uh, you get to love things about a person, but not everything. So for them, you love things about them. So somebody, naturally, right, he goes and he defends the weak. I love that about him and what he did. It tells me there is decency in him as a human being. So you love that in him. You love in him, for instance, that he wrote a book about it, that he in an interview, he did this and this, and he explained it so well that I even learned something from it. I love him for that. But there are other things about him that I would not like. So it's kind of divided love. And you're fine, inshallah, to do that. Barakallah. Tawbali. Mm -hmm. So, how do we, how do we enjoin people to protect the Allah in order to protect ourselves? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Without causing a greater harm to the community. Mm -hmm. For example, we see today people cannot even invest. Mm -hmm. No. And that is making a lot of people just take a step back to see it. Mm -hmm. But they say, you know what? There's, there's too much negative consequence that comes out of it. And there are some factories it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You would have to say it and let the chips fall where they may. Mm -hmm. How do we balance that? How do is the ego uh, at the same time minimize the negative consequence? Mm -hmm. No, Yeah, that's a good question. How do you call out evil and condemn it um, at the same time realizing that there are negative consequences that would uh, visit you and your loved ones uh, based on the stance that you're going to take? So on the one hand, you want to be brave, you want to be fearless, you want to speak the truth. On the other hand, you realize that if you do this, Without reservations, you're going to be harmed in the process. So how do you find the balance? And of course, there is no one single line that we can say this, but not that. Say this, but don't say that. Because all it, it all depends on the person and the consequences that you'll receive and what you're able to tolerate. Possibly, right? Let's, let's take it to an extreme here. A person can go to an unjust leader to them, in front of them, and command them, and forbid them, and get killed in the process. And the Prophet ﷺ said that this is the greatest shahada. A'adhamu shuhada'i inda Allahi Hamza. The greatest shaheed with Allah Azza wa is Hamza, and somebody who did what I just told you. He goes to a leader like that, unjust, tyrannical, command him and forbids him, and that leader kills him. So this person sacrificed himself, right? 
He killed himself. And maybe in the process, maybe before that, he could torture him. So should he do this? Should he not do this? Well, the Prophet ﷺ called him what? The greatest shaheed. But not everybody is supposed to do this. Because if you can't tolerate that, if you don't have enough iman, if this is going to be a fitna for you, would you do it? You could lose your faith. You understand? That if he takes you and puts you in prison for 10 years, he can come out of that prison an atheist. Where was, where was God, you will say? I did this for God, where was God? The question here is what? We were not strong enough to be able to withstand that pressure. So you don't invite too much scrutiny, too much pain beyond what you are able to bear. You realize your iman. You realize your strength and you realize what you can bear, what you cannot. And again, it is all judged by benefits and harms. So we want to do it. Think about it. Consequences will follow. Are you willing to carry those consequences? If you say no, I can't bear that, then you stop. You moderate your language. You disguise your language. You hide a little bit of this. But at least you say something. Right? And if not publicly, at least to people who are around you, at least you could gather this, you could do this, at least at a minimum, you fix yourself. You say, I'm in a state where I can't jeopardize anything and I cannot take any pressure, but at least I can do what? I can be a righteous person at least, right? I can do dua, I can do sadaqah. So you see where your minimum is and you do your minimum. And again, there will be some people who will say, it doesn't matter to me. But understand that there will be a price. Are you willing to pay it? If you can pay it, speaking the truth, we're not saying transgression, not injustice, not empty threats, nothing haram. That's your line also, nothing haram, but just speaking the truth. You say, if I can't do that, then obviously be wise about it and say and do what you can that's still within the realm of the possible and the bearable. If you cannot, then you understand your limit. So it varies from one person to the other. But again, benefits and harms, don't invite more harm to yourself than the benefit, more harm to your family than the benefit, and more harm to your society than the benefit. And if you're in doubt, you say, I'm not, I don't really know, ask someone. Consultation, shura is always good. Yeah. Okay, so your question is that um, if you know that a person commits a sin publicly and you already had warned them about it, but they continue to commit this and they continue to commit it often, was that single time, uh, one time a warning sufficient or do I have to keep reminding them to protect myself, right? No. So, of course, I mean, the public sin that we talk about, it varies, right, from the major sin to the not-so-major sin, from a sin that is really destructive for the sin that is not, from a sin that is being committed while you're around them to a sin that is committed when you're not around them. So it all really varies. So that's what makes it a little bit hard to pinpoint that sin, and so the question becomes, uh, I have to give a general answer. So what we'll say is that, first of all, if you want the benefit of that person, you want to benefit him, you want to uh, uh, rescue him, repeat the warning, right? From time to time. Um, it might be sufficient in terms of, you know, my obligation to have just said it once, especially if they are not receptive, very resistant, uh, very stubborn. Maybe enough is enough. One is enough. But if you think about saving them and changing them, one time is not enough. So he's saying, for my sake, especially that I'm going to be in close proximity to them, um, I have to keep reminding them and reminding myself that this is not right. Hopefully that one day they'll change. So it requires work and cumulative work. And you have to build on it one after the other. Keep thinking about different ways to help them. And it's important to not be present around them when they're committing that sin. Because that, again, 
indicates approval. So you distance yourself from them when they commit that sin. If you reach a stage where you've given up on them and that sin is harming you, meaning harming you, meaning that it's leading you to commit the same thing, or being around that crowd is leading you away from Allah Azza wa then you have to distance yourself from Him. So I hope that helps, inshallah. Yeah, uh, in the back and then the front. Are we allowed to pray, praise who? Kuffar? So are we allowed to praise the kuffar for kind of superficial things? Well, these things that you talked about, this person is so funny, this person is so fast, this person, these are not things that are worthy of praise. If you're taking it as a fact, this person is so fast, or for instance, this person is so smart, meaning factually he's smart, then you're stating a fact. But not state it in a way that um, attracts people to him, embellishes his, uh, his, his abilities or uh, kind of puts people in love with him to be affected by that, by his, uh, by his lifestyle, by his thoughts. So you don't invite, you don't praise and through that invite people to that person. And if the thing is in itself is silly and nonsensical, you wouldn't praise it. He's so funny, right? Or he is, I don't know what other examples, but yeah, that kind. He is so rich, you know, he is so. If these things are not worthy of praise, they're not supposed to be praised. And if he is worthy of praise in certain areas, if it's factual, you can say it, but at the same time, not in ways that elevate him so that people are impressed. Good, exactly. Mm -hmm. No, no, that's a, that's a very good question. So what is our stance when it comes to the weak ahadith? Do we take them, do we accept them, do we disregard them, do we ignore them, neglect them completely? What do you do with them? And so, of course, um, it depends on the area and what you're trying to take from them. If we're talking about a hadith uh, that pertain to the ahkam, halal and haram, you know, this is halal, this is haram, this is a ibadah, this is not a ibadah, then you want the strongest a hadith for you to base your ibadah on. So you really are focused on the authentic, right? Authentic a hadith. There might be a, a small space, and, and of course you understand the scholars now will have varying opinions when it comes to how much can you take from the weak, but there may be some sp small space for the weak ahadith when it comes to the ahkam, um, the rulings of halal and haram or how to worship, where the hadith is not very weak. And the hadith already supports something that is already established in Islam. Okay, so it tells you, for instance, read the Quran because the reading of the Quran gives you this, 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 this. If it's moving you in that direction, it's not establishing anything new, but it's establishing the virtue of the Quran. And that is already established by um, authentic ahadith that could be a motivation an encouragement so you think yeah it is weak but I'll use it as a motivation right so there's a little bit of space for it when you come to the ahadith, what we're doing right here which is what uh, a zuhud or a suluk or purification of the heart um, there is more space for the weak here because you take lessons from it so you have to distinguish first of all what is authentic and what is not and then you have to distinguish what is hadith and what is just athar or traditions. And once you do this, you have a different criterion for each. The authentic hadith, you take all of it. The weak hadith, you'll say, okay, now this is weak, but can I learn anything from it? Uh, maybe there's something beautiful here. I can take that. So you don't deprive yourself of benefit. At the same time, if it's saying something that is wrong, you can dismiss it. So it's not an obligation on you to believe it or to follow it. Some of these traditions are what we say. You say, okay, this is right, but this is wrong. Take this from it, ignore the rest. That's the benefit. So just like a wise saying, you hear somebody and they say something wise. Do you not take it just because they're foolish the rest of their day? 
You take the wise thing that they say. It's the same thing with these traditions. If there's some wisdom in them, you say, hey, this is nice, let me take it. But you don't necessarily believe that everything that is there, or in a weak hadith, everything that is there is right. So you apply a filter, right? So what passes through this filter is the beneficial, and you leave the rest. And that's why you find like Ibn al-Qayyim, he will mention this, 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 this. So they don't apply the strictest of, uh, uh, the strictest of uh, kind of calibers or kind of conditions. So say, I will include all of this because there is benefit in it. Allah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's new. So, if if uh, hadith, if weak hadith is telling you about uh, the, the signs of the day of judgment, alamatu sa'a, and it adds because it's weak, it adds two additional ones that are only found in this weak hadith. That hadith on its own does not provide enough evidence for you to believe that it's actually going to be true, right? Because he's telling you now independently this thing and that thing independently on its own it can establish that. But if it's talking about other things that other authentic hadiths have explained, then yeah, it may be able to shed some light, right? Because a weak hadith, it could be a statement of a sahabi or a statement of a tabi'i. So it's not without complete you know, benefit. So there may be some benefit in it, but it just depends on what it's introducing. But on its own, it cannot establish something new. So your question is about how to to bridge that gap between what we were and how we are today. Is that what you're talking about? Okay, inshallah. I'll answer it, right? And tell me if this actually um, applies to your question. So the fluctuation is necessary, right? It has to happen and there are benefits to it. So having this great or the greatest of Iman is beautiful because when you reach that, you know what you get from it. You know how close you can be to Allah Azza wa Jal. It gives you that feeling like firsthand this is what it feels like when I have Iman. This is what it feels like when I'm close to Allah. So there's sweetness has to be experienced because you can always come back to it. You can always refer to it and say, I want this again, I want this again. A feeling that you have in Ramadan or when you go to visit uh, Mecca and Medina or um, you just exert yourself and you just reach levels of Iman that you did not reach before and then you say to yourself, I can feel it, I can testify that this is true and because I'm feeling it. But you also have to drop because in this drop, Allah Azza wa destined it because it fights arrogance first of all. It teaches you your own limits and mistakes and weaknesses so that you can treat them because you can't be on top all the time if you still have struggles within. 
So it teaches you, okay, you've reached it, but now you have to fix A, B, C, and D. And you have to learn also that when you drop, not to drop too low. How do you manage the whispers of the shaitan that he talked about where he's trying to drown you in sin or make you desperate of Allah's mercy or of your own self? Uh, you can never be that good again or you're not a good person. How to bounce back, how to repel those attacks of the shaitan and find your way back to Allah Azzawajal, despite all the obstacles. So that in itself is a jihad, right? So if you can take it and consider it to be a struggle among the struggles that Allah had put that he wants you to overcome and he had put it there in your way for a reason, then you will push yourself to gain the same status that you had before. So the shaitan is always going to whisper and shin is al sin is always going to be part of our lives. But it doesn't have to be a dominant part or a very repetitive part, but a part that when we fall, we learn from, and when we bounce back to be better than we were before. And you compensate, and you be continue to compensate. So push yourself, this is what I would say, you continue to push yourself and never satisfied with the position that you're in. Because you, we settle, right? Kind of stagnate and settle. You kind of tend to fall into the same routine. I wake up and pray and sleep and eat and repeat and repeat and repeat. So you taste to yourself, well, can't like stagnate at this level. What can I do that can push myself? So if you're unhappy, and that's a good thing. If you're unhappy, you say, I'm not, I'm not happy with the way that I am right now. So you find ways to improve. And these are the small ways that kind of push you again to Allah. Did that answer? Yeah. But is that a sin that you commit or are you committing different sins? I'm not talking about you, but hypothetically. Uh huh. Okay. And this branding is branding coming from them or? Okay, okay. So the, the question here is that you often, you know, people often or sin gets normalized through friend groups. So you're friends with a lot of people or with some people and they commit the sin together. So that's how it becomes normal. So if you're a member of that group, as many of us could be members of those groups, you know, sisters who sit and they could gossip with each other, men who could sit and they just commit sins together. And it becomes common and accepted because everybody's doing it and it's fun. Because everybody, this is how you bond, right? You know how, you know, when they want to sit, they just drink beer? I mean, what, what's, what's with beer? But it's just a bond. It's a common activity, right? And also, you can, it's a social lubricator because now if you're shy, now you're not shy anymore, right? I mean, so inhibitions, they go away. So if that's the way, if this is how we communicate with each other, if this is how we, uh, we establish that social bond, and that's difficult, by the way, right? Like if we sit, let's imagine, uh, if we sit and the thing that keeps us together is gossip, and you say, stop gossiping, what are we going to talk about? That would be such an odd, you know, time to sit talk, talking about nothing or serious things. So you have to catch yourself, say, no, this is haram, this is haram, this is haram. And then they'll tell you, branded as you said, who do you think you are? You're better than us? The thing here is that if you notice what's wrong, and Allah had given you, as you said, the hidayah, that it's incumbent upon you to say something, regardless of what they say about you. You have to say something. Even if you're in the same sin at that moment, but you say, guys, don't you think that this is wrong? This is going too far. This is, Allah is upset because of this. Even if you're committing it at that level. Because you have to at least register an objection with Allah Azza wa Jal that I did say something about it. Even if you are weak. Even if you don't leave it. Even if they brand you. Now, of course, right, once you say it, things will be expected from you. Which is what? Distance yourself from it. That's what they want. Because you don't want to contradict, as you said, لِمَ تَقُلُونَ مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ 
Okay, if this, why do you say what you do not do? So if you think that this is wrong, then stop. So they'll, they'll expect and demand conformity between speech and action. And they are right. But even if you fail, even if, you still have to say something. And then add on yourself the obligation of, I need to follow upon what I'm saying. I need to really do it. And maybe that will give you that incentive. But regardless, don't worry about what they say. You just have to say, again, register in front of Allah, at least in one of those days, I said this is wrong, and at least some of them heard it. Because you don't know how they'll take it and change because of it. So just say it. That's, what, that's my recommendation. Okay. We're good. Uh, Mm -hmm. So your question is about how to navigate the fact that um, you've seen that how people, when they want to speak out against evil, right, what is happening today, there will be real consequences to it. So they will lose uh, uh, worldly advantages, right? And so, and then you were saying at the same time that their objections or their criticism of the injustices um, are having little effect. So how do you manage to, at the same, on the one hand, speak out against evil, right? While well, at the same time, right, things are supposed to get worse and worse. And you're thinking that, okay, I'm having little effect anyway. Um, it's, it's not always an easy decision to make, like to speak and when to speak and what to say and will I make a difference or not? That's not an easy thing to do. So, and we were saying that always if you are confused about anything that you want to do, right? Always talk to people around you and always consult and even pray istikhara before you do something so that you understand that you've asked Allah Azza wa for guidance and so that you will be as effective as you can in whatever you're doing. You don't want to waste your time and you don't want to waste your potential and you don't want to waste your energy. At the same time, uh, if all of us do nothing because things are getting get bad, then things are going to get bad because we're not doing anything. So we have to do something. Now, generally speaking, yes, things are gonna get worse and worse and worse, but we also see periods in history and there will be periods in the future where things are gonna get better. So at the time of Isa alayhi salam, at the time of Al-Mahdi, things are gonna get better. So it gets worse and better, worse and better. But our job is, okay, if you see in front of you an injustice, something that is wrong, if you could do something about it, and I'm saying something, then you have to do that something that what is this something now that it's going to depend on to be different from one person to the other, one country to the other. So when you look at yourself, you can say, I'd be most effective in doing this and this and that. I'm not effective in doing other things, but I can be effective here. Then you do that. But what we want to say is that each person has to do one thing. And that, I, don't mean pro, I don't mean anything on social media. I don't mean any protesting. I don't mean these things. I mean that you look at it and you say it has to change something in me. Yeah, and you make me more observant, make me more pious, make me more uh, a better worshiper of Allah Azza wa I stay away from the haram, I teach this religion. Uh, I spread what the truth is, I teach Quran, I teach Sunnah, I teach this. There are no consequences, bad consequences to this. But, uh, no, 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 but I'm saying all of us, right? There are no bad consequences to this. But you're spreading that circle of righteousness. That's what you do, right? So. 
there's very safe things that everybody can do, which is at least in your own way, right? Just be, be a cause for Allah's blessing, not a cause for Allah's curse for all of us. And don't be the one who brings Allah's punishment. It contributes something. Each person can. I don't have to shout free, free, right? I don't have to shout this, right? If that's not the thing that I am good at, right? And even doing that, it could be beneficial. It may not be as beneficial. But the thing that is truly, truly beneficial, expand the circle of Allah's pleasure, right? So spread the right aqidah, spread the right sunnah, invite people to Islam, get more people into Islam, the new Muslim, teach them Islam. So the circle grows bigger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? So you agree with what you say, you know, my brother, you have to this is not good, you need to stop doing this. Doesn't that make you a Munafiq? Mm -hmm. um, you can't read the Quran if Allah says you can't read these things, but if it's not, then it's like if it's just told us, yeah, you read the twelve you know, great books of hadith and blah blah blah, and it makes you a Muslim. So it's like you're a Munafiq if you don't read the But that's a sunnah, not a lowest level of Shahada. Do not let mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, inshallah. So the question is that if I know somebody who's committing a sin and he is public with that sin, he brags about that sin, and I'm committing the same sin, but it's private and I'm hiding it, should I advise him not to commit that sin, even though I'm committing it? And if I do this, is this hypocrisy? And he, say, he cited the ayah in the Quran where the hypocrites will be in the lowest ranks of hellfire. So he's saying that's a, a, the severest punishment available to be in the lowest ranks of hellfire. So is this hypocrisy? Or should my intention be that, yes, though I'm doing that sin, I want to save my brother. So I tell him, brother, you know, you're committing this sin. I want to save you from it. And that should be the intention, right? And that definitely should be the intention. So first of all, if you notice somebody who's doing committing a sin and you're committing the same sin and he's doing it publicly, there are two obligations on you, as the scholars have said. One, to repent from that sin and to advise him against that sin. So for you to repent and for also for you to advise him against it. So two obligations. So, so if you cannot do one, which is to repent from it at the moment, don't neglect the other responsibility, which is to teach him not to do it. Because there are two things required of you. So does this make you a hypocrite? It doesn't make you a hypocrite because you're struggling with that sin. You're not happy with it and you want to quit it and you feel ashamed of it and you're trying. But if all of us are going to wait until we're okay before we say something, then we're not going to speak. All of us have something. So I can't be perfect with Allah Azza wa before I speak. We have to say something about it. And it could be that your advice to Him prompts you to change your ways. Or because of it, Allah gives you the energy to save, to save yourself because you wanted to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you wanted to save Him. So you wanted the best for Him, so Allah gives you the best he wanted that change so it's definitely not hypocrisy the hypocrisy that you talked about in the quran these are those who hide disbelief and exhibit and pronounce belief these are in the lowest ranks but you were talking about is pleasing to allah Azza wa Jal, which is to help your brother so definitely i mean you can if you wish say i'm gonna fix myself so you go and repent and stop and then come back and give him advice so that your advice will be even more effective. But if that's not tenable, if it's not you know, within reach, you would want to neglect two responsibilities. So do what is available, inshallah. Barakallahu feekum. Barakallahu feekum.